Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by John Philip Newell, the former warden of Iona Abbey in the Western Isles of Scotland, founder of the School of Earth and Soul, and the author of the recently published Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. Newell discusses how Celtic Christianity provides an avenue for recognizing the sacredness of the earth and the sacredness of the feminine. We talk about this, the flow of God through all things, a rethinking of original sin, and so much more. So please join me in a fascinating conversation with John Philip Newell. John Philip Newell is an internationally acclaimed spiritual teacher and popular speaker. He has been described as having the heart of a Celtic bard and the mind of a Celtic scholar, combining in his teachings the poetic and the intellectual, the head as well as the heart, and spiritual awareness as well as political and ecological concern. He holds a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, and he has authored over 15 books, including The Heartbeat of God, A New Ancient Harmony, Sounds of the Eternal, The Rebirthing of God, and the recently published Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. The former warden of Iona Abbey in the Western Isles of Scotland, Newell is the founder of the School of Earth and Soul, a Celtic initiative of study, spiritual practice, and compassionate action, and teaches regularly in California, New England, Virginia, Colorado, New Mexico, and Canada, as well as leading international pilgrimages to Iona. John Philip Newell, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you, Nick. So good to be with you. Uh, I'm very honored to speak with you today. Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul is the first work of yours that I have read, um, and I've read it twice now, and <laughs> it, uh, it it's really piqued my interest to explore your other works. I, I think you have an important message uh, in your in your book, and I think this uh, book will be an interest to a very diverse audience. Uh, I think it's very accessible. Uh, it's a highly readable book and incredibly thought provoking. The book itself is grounded in Celtic Christianity, so I thought a good place to start this conversation. <laughs> would be to ask you to speak a little bit about the Celts and Celtic Christianity. You know, who were the Celts and in what way or ways is Celtic Christianity different than what many people may understand to be mainstream Christianity? Yeah, thank you. The, um, although we, we now uh, understand the, the Celts as uh, primarily uh, people in places like Scotland here or Ireland or Wales or Cornwall, historically that, that's just the edge of uh, a great span of Celtic peoples that uh, as around 500 BCE stretched from as far east as modern Turkey and as far west as the Atlantic coastline of Spain. So this was a a vast interconnected network of people sharing a common language base and culture and art forms. And some of the characteristics of of the Celts uh, historically has been uh, a people who are deeply in relationship with, with the earth and earth-related themes and um, nature-related themes are accentuated in in their earliest art forms. So uh, Celtic Christianity uh, refers to that that stream of Christian thought, Christian wisdom, that began to express itself in the Celtic world, especially the Celtic world of Gaul and and Galicia uh, originally, and then spread to places like the Celtic territory of Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Uh, Very early on, it was accentuated by uh, a sense of the sacredness of the earth. Uh, Roman historians encountering uh, Celts who were Christians in in Gaul were perplexed by these uh, Celts saying, um, they, they, they don't worship with temples. And that's because the Celts were worshiping in the mountains. 
uh, which had always been seen as, as their sort of living cathedral, uh, to, to be out in the context of the vast sanctuary of the divine. Uh, Roman historians very early on, again, uh, refer to them with some perplexity ab about the fact that the feminine is, is honored uh, within Celtic wisdom, within Celtic practice and imagery. So these are some of the features that in fact appear in the Celtic world uh, when there's a transition that occurs between Druidic earth-related mysticism and Christ earth-related mysticism. And it is a transition. It's, it's not in any sense a, a, a conquering of the pre-Christian or a rejecting of pre-Christian wisdom about the sacredness of the earth and the harmony of the spheres and the healing properties of the plants and so on, but is a transition that, that can be seen as, um, as allowing the Christ figure to bring into greater fullness of, of expression some of the wisdom that uh, was, was within the Celtic peoples in the pre-Christian period. Uh, I mean, a sixth century bard in Ireland, for instance, said there was never a time when Christ was not our teacher. Uh, we just didn't know him by name. Uh, so uh, the uh, conscious acceptance of, of the story of Christ's wisdom that began to uh, penetrate into the Celtic world in the second century and following uh, was, was seen as a sort of coming to fullness of a lot of the wisdom that was already deep within them. So uh, the, one of the, one of the uh, results of, of this was that uh, when Christianity, when Mediterranean Christianity got into bed with empire in the fourth century, uh, they didn't look favorably uh, uh, upon the, the Christian expression of wisdom that was more and more gaining ground in, in the Celtic world. Um, because of course, when Christianity became the religion of empire, uh, it, it was forced in many ways to speak convenient truths uh, for empire. And, uh, and empire wasn't interested in hearing about the sacredness of the earth because what empires do is use the earth, uh, whether that is the Roman Empire, the British Empire, or the American Empire. Empires have tended to want to simply make use of the earth rather than honor it. Uh, similarly, uh, empire uh, wasn't very impressed with um, a wisdom tradition within Christianity that, uh, that deeply honored what is deepest in every human person. So instead of the doctrine of original sin, for instance, which dominated in the Mediterranean Western Christian tradition, what we see very early on in the Celtic world is a, a, a sense of the original sacredness, or to use the phrase of someone like Matthew Fox, original blessing. Uh, what is deepest in us is not opposed to God, but rather is of God. And this, um, this threatened the whole authority and hierarchy system of uh, imperial Christianity. So many of the Celtic teachers, the ones I deal with in the book, um, find themselves being excommunicated or thrown out or judged by, by imperial Christianity. You mentioned towards the end of the book um, that, you know, the people that you're looking at, they're rebels. And I think you use the language, you know, radicals. And yeah. uh, you tell this uh, very short anecdote of a woman who is attending one of your speeches where she not so quietly uh, realized that you too were a radical. And I wanted to ask you about this, what, what you meant by radical, because the sense that I'm getting is that radical, it doesn't mean extremist. It means more towards the actual meaning of the word of getting back to the root, getting back to the foundation. Uh, is that a correct assessment? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about that, that uh, story and that particular woman 
is that she had been to many of my talks before, uh, but it was as if halfway through this particular talk, you know, suddenly the penny dropped. Suddenly she saw the implications. And that it's in that context that I speak of the radical implications of, of a wisdom tradition that, that celebrates the sacredness of the earth and the sacredness of each human being. I mean, if I, if I regard you as sacred in your essence, then I'm being called to, to, um, to honor you in, in the way I think about you and the way I look at you and the, the way I relate to you. Uh, and similarly, in relation to the earth and every life form, it's, it's not just a way of seeing, it's a way of seeing that has uh, radical implications that, that, that challenge how we have uh, dishonored one another as races, as religions, as often as individuals. It challenges how we are living in, in relation to the earth. Um, so ra radical in that sense, it's calling us back to what I believe the, the true center of relationship should be. And that is for me to allow my sacred center to be in true relationship with your sacred center and the sacredness of everything that, that has being. Yeah, very good. Wonderful. Um, I think that one of the things that I really appreciate about your work and, and this sort of radical nature of it, uh, I had a conversation a while back with um, Dr. Christopher Bache, who taught religious studies uh, here in the States. And one of his observations was that all the world's religions seem to have gotten two things wrong. They get the earth wrong and they get women wrong. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it seems like your work is an antidote to that. And I, I'm, I'm curious about mm -hmm. these two ideas of the sacredness of all things and the <clears throat> restoration of the sacred feminine. I've often had debates with some Christians who accuse environmentalists as worshiping the earth, not God. And this always seemed to me to be a fairly shallow understanding of both God and creation. Uh, it's a very dualistic theological model. How would you respond to someone who had this attitude that they still cling to this separation of God and creation and see us as being separate from God? Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. If I if I could back up first, mm -hmm. just to underline uh, the the relationship between honoring the earth as sacred and honoring the feminine as sacred, uh, hand in hand. I mean, the, the 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 dishonoring of the earth has gone hand in hand historically with the dishonoring of the feminine. Uh, and the, the birthing energies of the earth, the birthing energies of the feminine uh, have, have been again and again subordinated. And, and I think uh, what, what a political, what the sort of shadow forms of political authority and religious authority have done in arraying themselves up over against the earth and against the feminine um, speak, uh, speak in part of a fear of, of, of the deep energies for birthing and for new life. And in that sense, uh, not quite being able to control sort of what, uh, what the earth produces and, and what the womb of the feminine produces. And, um, and one, of, one of the points that I make in the book and I, I feel quite strongly about is that the sacredness of the feminine is yes, emphatically about honoring the sacredness of women. It, it is also about uh, identifying the feminine expression of the divine in each one of us, whether we are men or whether we are women, and identifying the, the feminine dimension within us collectively. And I see that, that as the, the dimension of the divine that within us that, is, um, that, that has energies, especially for uh, holding all things in relationship and interrelationship, uh, th that side of us that accentuates uh, union 
um, yeah, and uh, as someone like Teilhard de Chardin, one of the, the great prophetic figures that I draw on, he speaks of, of the, the fragrance of the feminine. And by that, he's meaning that, that dimension within us that invites oneness, so that invites union. So um, I would entirely agree with the, the sense that, that the, uh, so much religion has failed in its neglect of, of both the earth and, and the feminine. Uh, concerning the sort of the confusion of, of uh, a tradition like, like the Celtic tradition with um, the practice of worshiping the earth. I mean, uh, it's interesting because this is what someone like Pelagius is accused of in the fourth century. And I find uh, myself being accused of this uh, often in, in the 21st century. So what is it that gives rise to that confusion? You know, when, when we begin to speak about the sacredness of the earth, what some people immediately hear is, ah, you know, you, you're, you're worshiping the earth or you're believing that the earth is God. It's interesting lo looking at, at some, some of the development of thought and wisdom in the 19th century in the Celtic world, uh, because some of these Christian uh, teachers at that stage were speaking ab about um, a Christian pantheism. And um, I, they were grasping at, at a term to pull together their love of Christ and love of the earth. I think that wasn't the right term. Um, late in the 19th century, there was the development of another term, which I think is much truer to the vision of earth and Christ that we get in the Celtic stream. And, the, and that is the term panentheism. So, uh, you know, if the word pantheism is uh, derived from pan, meaning all things, and the theism, meaning uh, godness, the godness of all things. Um, pan and theism, by placing that those two letters in between pan and theism, uh, we come to the um, the vision of um, God being in all things, or, or as the Celtic teachers often say, and I, I prefer to put it poetically as the Celtic teachers do rather than primarily philosophically, but panentheism uh, poetically is expressed in terms of the light within all light, the life within all life, um, uh, the, the one who is deep within all, all things. Um, and that, that is not a confusion of the earth with God, um, but rather is a celebration and a deep honoring of the divine uh, at the very heart of everything that has being. One of the great, greatest teachers, I, I believe, in this stream, and the one that I deal with in chapter three is John Scottus Eriugina. And uh, he loves to play with words, and one of the words he, he uh, particularly loves to play with is the word for God uh, in Greek, theos. And uh, he says theos is uh, derived from the verb theo, uh, which means to flow. Mm. And God, he says, is the one who flows through all things. And he uh, go, goes on to say that this flow of the divine is like this subterranean um, flow of, of God deep within all things. And he says if that flow were somehow dammed up, then everything would cease to exist. Uh, which is to say that that flow of the divine isn't, isn't only in pres present in some people or some religions or some nations or some life forms um, or present just some of the time, that is the very essence of our being. And what we're being invited to do is to come back into relationship with that essential flow. And what my relationship to you and and to others is to do what I can to help release the flow that is deep in your being, um, which is a very different way of, of, of co uh, communicating uh, a vision right, right at the heart of the Christ mystery. And, um, and I think one, one, of the, one of the greatest challenges for 
the Christian household at this moment in time is to um, see that the honoring of the divine in Christ is to be leading us not, not to see that divine presence in Christ as being an exception to uh, the rest of humanity or an exception to the earth, but rather to see that manifest manifesting or sharing of the divine as leading us to see uh, the flow of the sacred that is deep within every every person. It reminds me of a couple of things. One is I, in some of my own studies, I came across this idea that I think many people think of creation as a one-time event, uh, but yet there is also this theological idea that creation is constant. Yeah. Um, I know uh, Jonathan Edwards, I believe, had this vision of this all-loving God at the center of creation, constantly creating and pouring forth uh, his love into all of the creation. Mm. Um, so what you're saying reminds me of that. Um, but also, uh, and I wanted to ask you about this, uh, this idea of the presence of Christ in the world. One of the things that that brought to my mind was the very idea of ecology with, you know, the roots of ecology, you know, it's the whole, you know, the logos and most people, I think uh, I get this out of my students, whenever they see logos or ology and something, they always immediately think study of, but I was making a connection with what you were referring to as the uh, rewording the world uh, with ecology. So I was wondering if you might be able to speak to that a bit. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, from the, the modern day uh, poet Kenneth White that I, I derive that, that image of um, not only rewording the world, but um, what he goes on to say, reworlding the, mm -hmm. the world. And um, so uh, the, one of the, the aspects of, of the Celtic tradition that, that is very much to the fore when you, when you study these great teachers over the centuries is that so many of them keep going back to the opening words of John's gospel uh, which are in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then John goes on to say, and all things come into being through the word, uh, which is to say that you, uh, uh, that I, that each one of us is essentially a, a, an expression, um, an utterance of the one. Uh, each one of us is a unique and unrepeatable expression of the one and uh, that that is uh, not in any sense a static expression it's an ongoing expression and um, i i was at a uh, a church in virginia in the um, pre-pandemic world and uh, i was speaking about everything being essentially an expression or an utterance of God. And uh, someone present uh, in, in the gathering came up to me at the end of the talk and said, is there a connection between uh, the word utter and the word uterus? Mm. And um, I said, you know, wow, I, I think you're on to something. And um, I'm going to do an etymological check on that as soon as I can get my hands on my old, uh, on my uh, Oxford English dictionary. And, um, and sure enough, um, there is a connection etymologically. Uh, utera, um, uh, the old English utera, um, is, um, is, is, is based on the Latin uterus. Uh, and uh, that, that's, a wonderful a connection and I think is so true to what these Celtic teachers are saying about everything 
is being is an utterance of God. Everything has come forth from the very essence or from the very womb or uterus of, of God. And, uh, and the nature of the universe is, is that it's living. And anything that's not living and unfolding is, is finished. Um, so what each one of us is, is being called to get into touch with is this uh, ongoing expression of, of the life force and of the divine from deep within us to keep paying attention to what's the, what's the new form, what's the new expression of, of this utterance of, of my being. And uh, I, I've mentioned um, John Scott of Sarajevo saying that, that theos essentially means flow or the one who flows. Kenneth White, the poet, builds on that playfulness by saying God is not only the flow, but God is the glow flow. And, um, and I like to build further on that playfulness and say God is not only the flow, um, and God is not only the glow flow, but we need to let go to the glow flow. I mean, <laughs> so that we, uh, so that that's part of um, knowing ourselves to be uh, to be co-creators in this ongoing utterance. And uh, Kenneth White's point in, in, speak, in making the connection between rewording the world and reworlding the world is that uh, the ex uh, to the extent that we truly get in touch with our relationship with one another and uh, with the earth and the interrelationship of all things, uh, we uh, will be moving in the direction of needing to give new expression to this, uh, to this flow and to realizing that we've often seen it in very static and fixed and separate terms. And uh, when we get in touch with the creative ability to re-utter uh, the world or to reword the world, then we, we will find ourselves being part of transforming uh, our relationships and transforming the world. And I think that's what he means by reworlding the world. It also takes me back to your chapter on uh, St. Bridget of Kildare. And I, I found her to be incredibly fascinating. Um, but I was thinking when you were speaking of how we are to be co-creators, that she had this, uh, uh, Right. I don't know the correct word, role um, of midwife, and that uh, she's also connected to the liminal, the spaces between worlds. And it seems to me that she's an excellent model for our current condition, because we are in between worlds in many ways. You know, we are birthing something into being. And the question is, what are we birthing into being? And how are we going to go about doing that? And uh, I was just wondering if maybe you could uh, say a few words about St. Bridget. Um, I, it seemed to me that she, uh, the stories that you gave, that they weren't quite historical, but they also weren't quite mythical, that it was a blending of the two, which really seemed consistent with her um, liminality. That, that's right. Yes. Yes. So, so in a sense, uh, the question in relation to St. Bridget is not who was she, um, but who has she become mm. in the Celtic mind and the Celtic imagination over the centuries. And she's a figure that, that, that attracts uh, the imagination. Um, and the imagination has, has been cherished over the centuries in the Celtic world, uh, uh, to be made to, to be made in the image of God is to be made in the image of the dreamer, uh, or is to be made in the image of the imaginer. And um, I mean, you'll be familiar with that wonderful statement from Thomas Berry when he says the uh, the universe is so amazing it must have been dreamt into being. Uh, and then he goes on to say, and we are in such a mess ecologically, politically, religiously, environmentally. We are in such a mess, he says, we need to dream the way forward. Uh, we need to allow ourselves to imagine 
uh, ways of seeing, ways of speaking, ways of relating that we haven't known anything before. And I think that uh, Bridget is a figure who, who uh, can, can, can further midwife some, some of that in us. Um, and uh, the, the way in, in which legend is, is often takes some of its cue from, from uh, historical happenings in the Celtic world, but then allows it to further unfold. In, in you know the legend of Bridget being the midwife of the Christ child, um, th this seemed to pose no problem to the Celtic uh, imagination that a, that a fifth, sixth century saint should be present at the birth of the Christ child in first century Palestine, uh, because what the imagination does is is make two worlds one, or it speaks from the one world, the world of the eternal, that is in. Uh, all time, uh, all, all space. It, it does this sort of weaving together of, of what has often been torn apart. And I think that that, that is um, part of the sort of liminal uh, nature of St. Bridget. You know, what, what, what is the sort of liminality, the role of liminality that, that, um, that an icon like, like Bridget offers us to get in touch with. And I explore various liminalities in the book. And one is, the, one is that threshold place, that meeting place between the divine and the human, or the, that sort of liminal thin space between the sea and the shore, or between the creatures and humanity, or between night and day. Um, but it's also between the past and the present. And uh, I think that part of the great insight of, of, of figures in the Celtic tradition that I'm drawing on is, is that they, they see us in all these meeting places, um, that we carry the past within us, that, uh, that we live in the day, um, but that we've often neglected the night. Um, you know, we we're, we operate under sort of sunlight consciousness, but in fact, what we need in part to get back into relationship with is moon-like consciousness, because what the what the moon's light um, enables us to see much more is the mystery and the interrelatedness of all things, rather than uh, simply the distinction or separation between all things. That sounds um, rather uh, Jungian to me. And I know that yeah. um, I forget which chapter it is in. I know you mentioned Jung a few times, uh, but you do make a connection that I think applies here about holiness and health. And yeah. I know Jung was always thinking in terms of balance, that we needed a balance of the dark and the light. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm a great appreciator of Jung, and um, I, I would have loved to have a conversation with uh, Carl Jung about some of these Celtic figures. I, uh, my sense is that there would have been a lot of resonance. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's um, George MacLeod, the, uh, the 20th century um, founder of the modern day Iona community in, in Scotland, uh, he one of his mantras uh, was to speak about the holiness of wholeness, and uh, of course both both of these words, holy H O L Y and whole W H O L E, are derived from from the medi Middle English word hail, uh, which really means health. So uh, holiness is not not about somehow separating ourselves. From, from one another. Holy, holiness uh, in this stream of wisdom is about healthiness. It's about being in true relationship with the earth, in true relationship with one another. It's living in a true relationship with the heart of our being made, made of God. And, uh, and I, I think that that's one of the reasons why Celtic wisdom is in the midst of a type of resurrection or resurgence. Um, because it's it's um, it's offering us some ways of seeing that we're yearning for, that we're hungry for, uh, uh, we're we're hungry for wisdom 
that, that makes it a link between spirituality and, and healthiness, both physically and spiritually. Yeah, I think also it's very relevant in the sense that uh, I, I don't know about Europe, um, but in the United States, we're seeing a transformation of uh, religion here. And we're seeing a lot of people fleeing Christian churches. And I think one of the reasons is that it's not speaking to something really profound in their souls. And I see the work that you're doing providing an avenue uh, for people that they aren't getting in the churches. You know, this idea that we are all sacred and the earth is all sacred and that the, and I also think I love what you say about original sin, because I've often wondered what would this world be like if instead of thinking of ourselves and each, and each other as inherently bad, that we looked at ourselves as inherently good. And I like that you wrote, you know, that sin, it doesn't define our nature. It infects our nature. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, the doctrine of original sin, this doctrine that was developed, especially in the fourth century and following when Christianity became Im imperial religion. I, I sometimes describe it as our obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, you know, we can hardly get through a hymn. We can hardly get through a sermon. We certainly can't get through any major sort of doctrinal expression of truth without going on about how horrible we are. And um, and I, th I think that uh, words like perverse and, and sick um, are words that I use about that that doctrine. I don't think these. I don't think that's putting it too strongly. Um, you know, if if we tell our daughter as she's growing up that she's ugly, that she's stupid, that she knows nothing, at some level she will come to um, take that definition into herself. And I think that that's exactly what has happened in, in so much um, of Western Christian thought and practice. Uh, at, at, to the extent that it doesn't take us long in, in any time of confusion or failure to go to the place of you know I'm I'm essentially sinful or I'm essentially confused or I'm essentially opposed to the divine rather than being of made of the divine. Um, a number of years ago I was giving a talk in Virginia and um, then we moved into dialogue form uh, at one stage and there was a rabbi there and an imam there to be in dialogue with me. And uh, someone in the audience uh, asked if we would speak about the doctrine of original sin. And uh, <laughs> this is a Christian problem. This is not a Jewish problem. This is not a Muslim problem. Um, Islam and Judaism don't begin uh, by teaching that, that what is deepest in us is opposed to God. They remember that, that what is deepest in us is sacred, it's of God. Uh, but the rabbi was the first to, to respond, and he said, original sin. He said, uh, that to most Jews would, would mean that was a really original sin. That was, that was really creative sin. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I thought at that moment, thank God for interfaith dialogue. I mean, here this rabbi had a room full of largely Christians laughing um, about this absurd doctrine. And, and I think it is absurd and it's, um, it's done horrendous wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I regard the, the, the uh, most sacred moments of my life as the births of my four children. You know, when, when I held um, a, a newborn child in my arms, um, I could see... Uh, the, the the light from from which we've all come I could smell something of the freshness from which we've all emerged uh, and uh, so I, uh, one of one of the things that I explore in the book is that we know this to be true about the newborn child and uh, there are many wisdoms that are in us 
uh, that we've never been taught. In fact, many of these wisdoms that we're being invited to recover again, I think when we do hear them, our deepest response, even though we may never have heard them, may never have been taught, is, oh, yes, you know, I knew that was true. Um, so why have I been allowed, uh, why have I allowed my religion or my culture to, uh, to teach me something so contrary to what I know in my heart about the beauty, the purity, the unspeakable um, holiness of the newborn child? I like that idea too, that, um, and this is the sort of subtitle of your book, if you will, the reawakening to what our souls know. And I think that this idea of original sin really is at the service of what you refer to as the um, uh, uh, imperial Christianity. And I also see this to go back to this radicalness uh, for a moment in this call for social justice, because I think there's something, and we see this, I know we're seeing it in the United States a lot, and I think it's elsewhere in the world, where people are really standing up to great injustices. And this is something that I think goes back to what Jesus was about was social justice. And this is the voice of the prophets as well, these calls to social justice. Uh, and I wonder if one of the things that we're seeing uh, with this transformation of Christianity, it seems so much that Christianity has been caught in this imperial Christianity, which is now more of a neoliberal <laughs> view of the world, which is having us destroy the world in many ways. Yes, I, I have found it so um, profoundly liberating to uh, get in touch with or to, to receive this uh, emphasis in Celtic wisdom uh, about a, a deep knowing that is in us uh, uh, as, as gift of our birth. Um, it, it's like... A, a, a birthright of every human being that uh, a deep knowing is is in us, um, not not um, doctrinal knowing so much as deep relational knowing. And uh, one of the liberations for, for me about that is that I think our role as teachers, but uh, the role of each one of us as as destined, I believe. Uh, called to be liberators of one another is, is that um, we're, we're not being called to do anything other than try to give expression to what the soul already knows. Um, and in so much of our Western Christian history, uh, the, the model of truth uh, ha has been entirely different from that. It, it's been a notion of, I have truth, you don't let me generously uh, tell you what it is, uh, rather than this simple attempt to try to articulate and to set free uh, what is already in the soul of, of the other. Uh, and uh, I think that historically would have led to a sort of radical humility in the teaching office of the church and instead of um, a hierarchy of, of truth and a type of hubris of, of truth over other traditions. Yes, and I, I like that the work is open to interfaith dialogue and other traditions. You know, when you spoke up, when you were speaking of flow, uh, I was thinking of Taoism and these ideas of Wu Wei, of going with the flow and being with the flow. Um, and I think that's so important today, too, to be able to have these conversations within other traditions. I know we're getting close to the end of our time together here. Uh, I have just a couple more questions for you. Uh, mm. One was, you know, the recent report, uh, the UN's IPCC report, said that the reality of climate change is unequivocal and we need to act now. We're also in the midst of a uh, mass extinction, 
And our situation at the moment sometimes seems rather dire, but yet your work seems very hopeful. And I was wondering what gives you hope? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a great and important question. And um, I, I, I think that, that this is a moment of hope. And uh, I've, I've quoted already from Thomas Berry, and I'd like to come back to him again. And uh, Thomas Berry, uh, before he died, speaking about this moment in time that we are in the midst of. And, and by this moment in time, I think Thomas meant primarily our growing consciousness of, of the interrelationship of all, all things and this growing sense of, of the essential oneness and sacredness of the earth. And uh, he said, we're, we're living in, in a moment of grace. Mm. Uh, because we are experiencing a way of seeing the interrelatedness, the oneness of all things, the, the likes of which humanity has maybe never had. Um, but very importantly, um, as well as acknowledging this as a moment of grace, being given a way of seeing uh, that can be part of transformation, um, he, said, he said moments of grace are transient. In other words, will we meet this moment? Will we serve this moment? Will we play our part in, in this holy work, the great work, as he called it, of, of, of transforming uh, ourselves back into true relationship with the earth and one another? Or will we meet, miss this moment? Uh, and, and we're in danger of missing it. Um, if we uh, don't pay attention to the awareness that, that is breaking through in every major discipline of thought and study. Um, all great disciplines are seeing how interwoven we are, how interrelated we are. And we can no longer pretend, I, can, I cannot pretend that, that I can be well and that my family can be well by ignoring the health and the education of the family down the road. I mean, the human species can't, can't pretend that we, that we can be well um, without honoring, reverencing um, the other species of the earth. Uh, our nations um, simply can't go on pretending that we can just look after our nation and, um, and ignore the well-being and, um, and just needs of, of other nations. Um, so uh, I, th I think it's 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 a matter of uh, of saying both. Um, I th I think that I am hopeful uh, precisely because of the growing awareness of the earth and our interrelatedness and the growing desire. And I th uh, and and that doesn't sort of make light of the challenge. The challenge is absolutely enormous. Um, but I think that that, that we that we have the capacity, God-given capacity, to imagine a new way of living and a new way of being. And uh, this relates in my mind also, Nick, to one of the earlier points you were making about uh, what, what part of what we're living through, uh, certainly within the Christian tradition, is the collapse of Christianity as we have known it. Um, millions, millions of my brothers and sisters from the Christian household who began life sort of within the four walls are, are no longer uh, gathering to be fed um, because they haven't been fed. Um, and uh, many who are still entering the four walls are nevertheless extremely hungry, yearning for uh, what will feed this a growing awareness of inter interrelatedness. So they're wanting to be fed by um, accessing the wisdom of other great traditions. They're wanting to be fed in ways of meditation and compassion that can be part of changing our lives and cha changing the world. And um, again, it's important to name the collapse, name, name what is happening, 
while at the same time, I, I would say it's never been a more exciting time to be a son of the Christian household uh, because uh, this diaspora or this exile, spiritual exile for so many, is highlighting, um, uh, is, is sort of uh, carrying and giving expression to the yearnings that will be part of the way forward. And I think to, to get in, in touch with these yearnings that have led to that sort of scale of dissatisfaction and exile is presenting us with an opportunity to be born anew, to, to use a, a one of Jesus's expressions, which I think we need to reclaim, because for me, it's about allowing what is deepest in us to be born anew, to come forth again. It's not about becoming something other than ourselves. That's quite beautiful. And I, when you were speaking, the what came to my mind is I've often liked an aspect of Christianity of uh, commensality, of eating together. Who do you bring to your table? And uh, it seems to me that with what you were saying, that you know there have been a lot of people, they're not getting the nourishment that they need. And now's the opportunity of inviting people back to the table uh, to break bread with others uh, in some yes. very profound ways. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, um, I'm, uh, I suppose I'm, I'm seen by many as uh, on the prophetic edge of calling, calling the Christian household to change. Um, but I am, I am a very grateful son of the Christian household. Um, I carry, I believe, uh, the gift of much, much of its uh, teachings deep, deep in my heart, and uh, and I think one of the things that about the Christian tradition that 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 I think is is so wonderful is that it does have a vision of everyone being fed, uh, and it does have a vision of of sharing bread together, sharing wine and bread together. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and, and, and and if we can if we can get that one right, I mean, I, I uh, um, I think that that's part part of rebirthing. Uh, I remember being um, in Delaware many years ago in a church in Delaware, and the the priest of of the Episcopal Church I was in very proudly showed me a letter of complaint that uh, one of his parishioners had sent to the bishop shortly after he arrived and the letter of complaint from one of his commissioners was writing to the bishop about this newly arrived priest and she said do you know that he allows just anyone to come to church <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah a vision of the kingdom of god coming i think yes well, and that's the, the, the final thing I'll kind of uh, mention here is the, uh, what really hit me or came to me a lot while reading the book was the statement of Jesus from uh, the Gospel of Thomas was, you know, the kingdom of heaven is here now yeah. and just don't see it. Um, yeah. And it seems like what you're doing is reminding us, yes, the kingdom of heaven is here now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we don't have to um, we don't have to create it. Um, we need to simply open to it, um, open to the to the flow that's already deep within us. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, one last question: Where can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah, I, I have a website uh, which is called Earth and Soul. Dot org. Um, so that's E A R T H A N D S O U L dot org. And um, uh, on that website, you'll get all of the propaganda about me and um, uh, specifically, you know, of course, information about my publications, but also very importantly about the School of Earth and Soul, uh, which is an initiative of study, spiritual practice, and compassionate action. Uh, that grows very much out of out of the Celtic stream, um, and information about the uh, pilgrimage weeks on on Iona, 
which we do four four times a year. And I'm uh, I'm an unabashed evangelist for um, pilgrimages on Iona. I think it's one of the most beautiful uh, islands in the world, and it's often a place where where people experience um, deep inner healing, um, a rebirth of vision, new commitment to be part of change. Um, so uh, information like that can be found on the website and um, you're very welcome to all of these uh, pilgrimage events or school events. Wonderful. Well, um, uh, I so appreciate your time uh, and being able to speak with you. I hope I can meet you some time in person and maybe attend one of your uh, speeches or a pilgrimage. Yes, indeed. And, and next time I'm in your neck of the woods visiting my sister, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. Yes, please do so. Please do so. Well, thank you again. I am very, very grateful. Many blessings to you, Nick. And that's a wrap on episode 11 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening. I wanted to take a moment to clarify something, though, from the discussion. Specifically, when I brought up the notion of ecology and the logos, what I didn't make clear was that the word logos also means word. So when you read the beginning of John's gospel, which John Philip Newell refers to, in the beginning was the word. In Greek, that is the logos. In the beginning was the logos. I hope this helps clarify the connection and gives greater insight into the idea of rewording the world. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive review on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews really do help. And please consider subscribing. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. For the time being, I'll be releasing episodes every other week with the goal of releasing them every week in the near future. I'm also working on creating additional video content for the YouTube channel, including book reviews, educational videos on topics concerning spirituality, the history of religion, and the religious response to the climate crisis. If you would like to support my work in creating free and credible material on YouTube, please consider making a one-time donation via PayPal. You can find links for both in the video description or show notes. Your support makes this podcast possible. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nourish your rebel spirit.